the focus of this um, conference is about uh, regulatory assurance and um, our regulatory compliance and quality assurance. And um, so we are focusing on, on the FDA, but generally this will apply to other countries, EU, ISO, or if you're in Africa, etc. cetera. Um, the rules generally apply, um, follow the same sort of method. So if you have any questions, maybe you've made a ventilator or maybe you are thinking of making a ventilator, how you can actually get that through uh, regulatory compliance and actually maybe to market if that's your interest. Um, so feel free to ask us any questions you might have as we go. I feel free, Rob's just posted a Google Docs link. Um, we'll be keeping notes, so feel free to view that and ask us any questions. We'll be starting in about two minutes. Uh, and Rob's also just posted the code of conduct if you need something to read. Um, general rules apply, you know, just um, it's a community here of volunteers and makers you know, open source um, designs. So it's all done in our free time. Uh, but the general rules apply to conferences. You know, it's a harassment free experience. Uh, if you have any issues with anyone, please email Robert. And uh, we'll make sure to resolve any issues you have. So Eric, are you going to share your screen? Uh, I will. Yep. I can do that now. Okay. So we'll be starting in a minute when Welcome the attendees who have just joined us. Please feel free to comment in the in the chat or uh, on the Slack channel in Helpful Engineering. We'll be starting starting now. We've got 10, 10 attendees. Welcome everyone. So welcome to VentCon uh, Quality Assurance and Regulatory compliance. Uh, we're focusing on the open source community that's um, building ventilators. Uh, there's various different devices and today we have a lineup of expert speakers around uh, uh, quality assurance and regulatory compliance and the state of open source ventilation as we go through the COVID pandemic in 2020. Um, First up, we have Dr. Eric Schultz from Australia, uh, focusing on clinical issues. He's an anaesthetist and uh, quite become quite a bit of an expert in, in the devices that have been around and uh, will provide some feedback from medical point of view. So Eric, over to you. Thanks, um, 
Thanks, Ben. Just let me know if my um, signal is no good. So I'm sharing my, sorry, I'm connected on two devices, which might be get a bit confusing, but I'm sharing, um, sharing my screen that hopefully you can all see. Um, so yeah, so as, as Ben said, I'm, I'm an anaesthetist um, in, in Brisbane, Australia. That's the hospital that I um, work in, that little uh, picture on the side. And that's me. I have to claim that's about 10 years ago. I don't look quite that young anymore. Um, I think the, the thing I noticed about this photo is there I am with my um, feet on the chair in the operating theatre, which possibly demonstrates that I'm a little bit of a rule breaker. Um, so you should all be aware of that, I guess. Um, so Ben, my slides don't seem to be updating. It says I've shared the screen. I'm just not seeing the um, new text come up. Not that it's not that it's that profound, um, but I don't know if my screen's frozen or something. Okay, that seems to be... Uh, are you going to the next slide or? Yeah, I've. Okay. So that's right. Most my slides aren't very profound this morning, so I can I can talk to them and you can see my face, I guess. Um, but so so thanks to to Robert and also Ben for organising this conference. Now I did I did speak at the earlier um, conference that um, Public Convention put on, and I'm I'm not sure how much the audience overlaps. Um, the one thing about that one is um, I had to grab it in very quickly so I went very fast so it's interesting that it's not really updating I've uh, uh, just taken the the pre uh the screen share from you if that's okay okay can you see that yeah so I'm on the one that says thank you um so I can just let you know next yep. slide if uh yeah if you can uh do that um so yep yeah, so uh, so I, I have reused my slides um, because I think last time I didn't get to give them full glory and the, the topic has changed. So I'll just be skipping through a few. Um, so, but I, I got involved um, basically because I, you know, I like all the rest of you saw the pandemic unfold and the, the word went out that we were desperately short of ventilators. Um, and I, what I saw on my YouTube feed was a whole bunch of, um, to be blunt, like middle-aged blokes retreating to their garage um, to make ventilators. And the thing that struck me about that was that they were actually doing, that they were coming quite close. And certainly um, it seemed to me that with, there was the potential to actually make a decent ventilator. And I'd, I actually believe that with, we're within striking distance of a, of a really good ventilator made from, very accessible parts for less than three hundred dollars, um, I would say, and I think there's a a lot of um, a, a lot of um, I'm on the slide that says how did I get involved. Um, so, so there's a lot of software challenges that we're yet to overcome, and some design challenges. But I actually do genuinely believe that we can do this um, very quickly, um, and there's a few reasons that hasn't happened. But um, so that's how I got involved. Was basically seeing this unfold, and I, so I made some I made some notes on what I thought a, a, a ventilator needed to do, um, because it, it seemed to me that a lot of the um, engineering teams just hadn't fully considered um, all the requirements, or so they hadn't been briefed. And a lot of the early documents, and yeah, even documents that were coming out from really good sources like the UK government, hadn't really fully described the problem that was. Um, that we had to address. So I, I tried to fill that gap um, with a big Google document. Um, so, and, and thankfully our government hasn't been as good as New Zealand. So I'm not quite in the same position Ben is. We've got a bit of an outbreak of COVID occurring south of us at the moment, but pretty much we've had very little workload from the pandemic um, in my state. And so I, we had some shutdowns because they were conserving the PPE. So I had plenty of time on my hands. So, um, that's why I've been able to continue to be involved. Um, so there's a lot to talk about. And one of the things I try and do is I get attacked by these um, sets of ideas. And I've created a lot of Google documents over the last few months. So there's there's various links. I mean, the, the initial one I wrote to is linked to there. It's a four volume. Um, Dr. Dr. I just, Dr. So let me interrupt. Which slide should you yep. be on now? Um, too much to talk about. Thank you. Yep. I'm, yep. I'm now sharing the screen. If you could tell me okay. um, the title of the slide 
when you advance. Okay. I'll advance for you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Robert. Um, yep. So that first link there is to the my, my Google Doc. Don't don't click out on these now. They're quite a rabbit hole. But just you might want to come back to these documents later on. Um, I made a few scrappy notes before the last VentCon on ventilation therapy, and I had a quick look at the protocols. As I said, I haven't actually been involved in ventilating anyone with COVID, but I'm I'm certainly familiar with ARDS patients, and I've I've checked the latest protocols from um, the organisations around the world that do know about these things and sit around in committees contemplating the best way of ventilating people. Um, and so what, what I say is, is based on a, a reasonably sound knowledge of, of what the um, people with on the ground experience are saying about what we need. Um, so then, I mean, since the last event, Con, I, I, it, it's, I, interacting with a few teams doing some things that I would describe um, politely as um, unusual approaches um, or they, they were very clever approaches but um, clever solutions to the incorrect problem I guess um, and I realized one of the fundamental aspects that was missing missing in the entire conversation was an awareness of how expensive it is to provide intensive care therapy um, and ventilation therapy. And I, I say, when I say expensive, I don't just mean in terms of dollars, although it is expensive in dollars. I, I meant the overall cost, the cost to the healthcare system, the cost of the community, the cost of the patient, um, and the, the cost of the patient's family. Um, and, and all of the, these costs really are enormous, and I think they're un, underestimated. So in as I've, I've looked at this, my, my belief has always remained that we, if we are going to be ventilating people, it's absolutely critical that we put them on ventilators that mean they will recover as quickly as possible. If, if we implemented a lot of these solutions that people are, are proposing, as, as clever as they are, we end up parking patients um, in this, you know, what I've, what I've described as a high resource consuming state. So you, you transfer a patient from a position where they're going through a lot of um, personal protective equipment in the in the staff um, around them, but they're getting one to four nursing, which means you know one nurse is looking after four patients, and that nurse will be keeping the patient reasonably comfortable, um, safe as they as they can be within the constraints of the therapy being given, um, and will be able to to look after them if. If you put someone on a ventilator, you, you render them absolutely helpless. They are completely dependent on the healthcare service to look after every single one of their needs. And that, oh, we, I'm still on too much to talk about, Rob. Yeah, thanks. Um, so that means that, um, yeah, that means they consume enormous resources. I mean, in a, in a modern well-resourced ICU, you've got one-to-one -one nursing. So to staff a, to staff a, an ICU bed, one single ICU bed on a 24 seven basis. That means that you need to have four fully trained intensive care nurses. So for every bed, so um, that's, that's what you need to do because of, because no one can work all the time and they need to have shifts and, and the, yeah, that sort of business. So you four nurses per patient while they're in ICU, um, you know, they, they need to be turned over, their nutrition needs to be looked after, their sedation needs to be managed, um, their electrolytes, the balance of salts in their blood needs to be, needs to be looked after. A whole variety of other complications need to be um, uh, treated and, and managed. And I sort of, I, I spelled all that out in, in, detail in the um, how expensive ICU care link is. Um, and, and so so for this reason, it's we just, as we look at providing a solution for intensive care units are struggling, they don't have enough ventilators. And I can tell you, if the healthcare system doesn't have enough ventilators, I guarantee you they do not have enough experienced nurses to care for patients on ventilators either. Um, that's 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 guaranteed to be the situation that we're looking at. And if they are able to find nurses, they're going to be extraordinarily inexperienced. And when I say nurses, I'm, I mean, you know, the entire healthcare team, you know, the respiratory therapists and the physios and, and all the rest of it. So 
you know, so 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 there's a couple of things that fall out of that. One is that any um, any ventilator we produce, it needs to be capable of getting a patient better as quickly as possible because essentially while they're stuck on the ventilator, the healthcare system, the entire healthcare system is, is hemorrhaging resources looking after one person, which means that lots of other patients are suffering, means diverse uh, resources are being diverted away from public health measures and providing basic life saving care to a whole bunch of other patients. Um, so that's the first thing. And the second thing is, is that if we're making ventilators for the pandemic, we need to be cognizant of the fact that these are gonna be operated by inexperienced teams. And even if, they're, even if they're dropping into a hospital, which does have a nice CU bed unit already, and they're, they're blessed to have some very experienced intensive care um, training and um, experience in the hospital, it's gonna be overwhelmed. Yeah, so you've got a hospital that used to run a five bed ICU, now it's running a 15 bed ICU um, in the middle of a pandemic. So they're losing staff to sick leave um, and all the rest of it. So the staff are gonna be very inexperienced. Um, so, and coupled with that, if, we, if they're getting ventilators off us and, and no, no offense to those um, present, and you know, I put myself in this category, if they're getting ventilators from us, they're not getting $20,000 ventilators, they're getting something that's been put together in a heck of a hurry, which means it's not going to have had the same, um, it's just not going to be as good, essentially, as the ventilators that come from, um, you know, that, that, that you buy off an experienced manufacturer for $20,000. $20, um, so that's quite a constellation of issues, which I think impacts on, on all of our conversations we need to be aware of it um, so I mean so very early on in the piece I, I also realized that um, yeah this was a big problem I thought we I thought a solution is possible and I yeah and I think that's really important to emphasize this um, yeah all of these problems are solvable that we have to address but it did seem to me that very few of the teams that I could see that were addressing this actually had the resources to do it all. Um, and for that reason, I thought it was vital that, um, you know, teams collaborate between each other. There's no point getting 20 people together to work on it. You need more than that. You need to have, you know, we need to be pooling our resources in the, in the best sort of free and open source um, spirit. And that, that involves decomposing the problem into workable chunks. Um, with clearly defined interfaces in both the hardware and the software. Um, and I, I believe that's doable for both the hardware and software. And I've laid out some frameworks in the first document um, and in a couple of other projects. I mean, I, I laid out a, a framework that the hardware people could start working together more effectively. Um, and then more, uh, more recently, I've been working with um, Ben and... Um, Robert to try and initiate a, a project and Anisha to um, start addressing the software issues, um, which are actually really fascinating. And I think we could deliver a lot of value there that would extend um, beyond the pandemic. Um, so I think one of the things I've realized, I've started looking at the regulatory issues in the context of this um, software or Ventos um, project recently. And I've realized that there's a big difference in the way that um, engineers approach the world and doctors approach the world. And I think that's um, a good thing and we could use that to our, um, thanks, thanks Robert. Um, I think we can use that to our advantage. I mean, it, it, I realize that a lot of the regulation is about guaranteeing that you don't have a bunch of sharks and I, I deal with a fair few company reps at work and I can tell you, I wouldn't trust any of them. Um, I'd be reluctant to buy a used car off any of them. And I, yeah, and I think a lot of the, you know, a, a lot of the um, regulatory framework that exists um, is there to stop the price gouging and the, the profiteering that um, unscrupulous corporations will commit in the context of um, you know, medical devices. And they're basically a bunch of liars, as far as I can tell, and you really cannot trust any of them. So it's not surprising that modern Western governments have built this entire infrastructure aimed at stopping these greedy um, people from lying um, and, and then disappearing in puffs of smoke. 
Now, I think in this context, I mean, none of us, has, as Ben has said, we're, we're here as volunteers. We're not, we don't have the same profit motive. Um, and I think we're going to, we, yeah, there's a danger that we tie ourselves up in knots by trying to conform to these regulatory frameworks that are designed to stop these multi-million dollar corporations who have very, very slick marketing people. You know, the, 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 these are highly trained marketing salespeople that come into hospitals to flog off their products. Um, and that's why they get regulated so tightly and kept on such a short leash. I think, um, yeah, so I, I think the hackers, we need to be a little bit more forgiving on ourselves. Um, so, and doctors think, do d think differently. We're, we aim to get the best outcome in the situation and we often work in a very untidy world. Um, yeah, our environments are often very messy, um, particularly in emergency. Things happen very fast and you just need to do the best you can. Um, and, and when you do have a little bit of time, we operate heavily on, on the basis of, of consent and patient autonomy. Um, and so f for me, when I'm delivering therapy to a patient, um, you know, the people who pay for my indemnity insurance, who I pay quite a lot to, um, just you know, emphasise this to me fairly frequently. Yeah, it, it comes down to explaining to patients, and if the patients aren't available to the people who've, um, you know, who would be their substitute decision makers, um, what the risks and benefits are of the therapy you're proposing, and what the alternatives are. And yeah, I have to say, never in all my years of practice has anybody, either my defence organisation or my various mentors over the years, have no one has ever said to me. Oh, for God's sake, Eric, whatever you do, never use a device that hasn't been approved for what you're going to do to it. Um, that, has, that has featured nowhere in my training. Um, so I think that's something to just be aware of. You know, when, you, when doctors look at a problem, they're not looking at whether it's been approved. They, doctors work from first principles um, and they're, they're highly trained in, in science and they get, you know, their, their decision making gets evaluated thoroughly. Um, so they'll just look at what's in front of them and, and work it out and can this do okay. Um, so that's just a, a let, good thing for Let me thing remind you, you uh, that you're 18 minutes in right now. Yep. 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 Thanks. Thanks, Rob. Um, so, I mean, I think my, my advice to the, um, to all the makers out there, um, is, I mean, I think the, the regulatory stuff is useful and the risk assessment stuff is, is useful. I think at the same time, I mean, I, the, the thing to emphasize is just be honest. I mean, that's the, that's the really critical requirement here. Don't pretend that your device is perfect when it's not. Just say what you've done. So I went to my shed and I did this thing and I hit it with a hammer a few times and it didn't break. Here we go. This is the design. What do you think? Um, publish early, break up the job into small bits and do the best you can um, and accept that not every pathway is the optimal pathway. Um, and that, you know, be prepared to say, okay, we've gone up a cul-de-sac. This is a dead end. We should turn around and, and do something better. I right, said so tips from a doctor. Next slide, Rob. Sorry. Um, and that, you know, when it comes to when it comes to um, proving proving things, just also just be aware that to actually get things to that level of of proof of of benefit is extraordinarily difficult. You you are you are looking at tens of millions of dollars, if not more, investment. Um, to actually prove something is good. And yeah, and I think if we put that up as a barrier, um, yeah, we, we may not be doing anybody any, any favors. So um, that's probably enough for me. I had a few other slides. These are all basically recycled. I'm just gonna see if there's anything that I really want to emphasize. Um, no, I think that's probably, that's probably it. All the rest of the slides there were just um, rehashed from my last presentation. So, um, it's probably most useful if I respond to questions. Okay, thank you, Dr. Schultz. Uh, we've got a few questions here. Um, sorry, we just had any technical difficulties with people joining um, Zoom. We'll get that fixed now. It might just be a, the link is, uh, has a problem, but we'll get that fixed. Um, Project Ventos can be found at the Helpful Engineering Slack channel at the moment. Um, there's no GitHub or anything set up officially. Um, so does anyone have any questions for Dr. Schultz 
at the moment. Okay, there's a there's a couple here. Are there any efforts to address the shortage of trained staff? Uh, well, that's a that's an interesting question. I'm I'm absolutely sure there 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 are. I mean, one of the difficulties in all of this, I think, is um, yeah. I mean, I've I've ended up as a doctor hanging about with a bunch of very privileged um, anaesthetists in a hospital that hasn't been swamped by a pandemic. Um, and then I've gone online and hung out with a bunch of engineers who, um, yeah, for the most part, don't have contact either with these people. So um, I mean, I'm sure there will be people addressing training. I guess the thing to be aware of is it doesn't happen overnight. Um, and getting that level of experience does take years and years. Um, so, I mean, yes, there, there, there will be efforts, but I'm, I'm not, I don't have my finger on them. Great. Um, so, yeah, the similar question was, so we're suggesting that we could also work on ICU management as well as ventilators. Um, um, yeah, I mean, if you're, from an engineering perspective, I'm not sure that, um, I mean, I, yeah, I'm not sure how much they can contribute. I mean, I'm, I, I am, and I, yeah, and I apologise, I'm, I'm not across this, but there will be organisations like Red Cross and Médecins Sans Frontières and um, yeah, a variety of others. The intensive care societies do have outreach um, programs into developing countries. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm sure th this is outside my area of expertise. You know, I'm not a, I'm not a military trained doctor. Um, I'm, a, yeah, I'm, a, I'm a civilian and I'm sure that the, uh, the various militaries around the world as well have got a lot of experience in, in ramping up this and what the logistics looks like. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, there's all sorts of opportunities. To some extent, I think the ventilators, the ventilators are the call that went out first. Um, and that's what people have focused on. Um, and I think it remains a, an interesting and, and worthwhile problem. And I think especially for those people who've already invested some time into now understanding the problem and have got bits of the solution. And I think it's really worthwhile if those people can to continue to work on the project, but it's, it's probably not the thing that's gonna save the most lives in developing countries. I mean, around the world, the most vital thing is public health and just stopping people from getting this virus, giving them masks, keeping them away from each other, shutting down the pubs where you've got hundreds of people coming together, that's, that sort of stuff. That's gonna save the most. Um, where it's spreading, um, you know, people need oxygen and they need basic therapy and anywhere where basic oxygen therapy isn't available, um, that's absolutely the biggest priority by you know by several orders of magnitude to be honest with you um so that people can be delivered non-invasive ventilation um right just time for one last question um jamie has asked on slack even if the cost to uh even if it costs money to park patients in a high dependency state on a splitter is it not better to do so until the ventilator is free to fully recover them rather than just letting them die, for example, if there is yeah. no resources? It's kind of a, um, a question that's been, been asked, I think, by various Yeah, and I'm really people. happy to go on the record on this. I think I would not put anyone on a splitter ever, full stop. I think they're, I think they're the wrong pathway. I think um, multiple professional organizations that I respect have said the same thing. Um, it's, you will do more harm than good with the ventilator splitter in the pandemic. I mean, I think that the only, um, the only indication I can see for a splitter is if you had a, a mass um, fentanyl gassing like they had in Russia a decade ago, and you've got, you've got 200 people who are basically fit and well, and you just need to babysit them till the drug wears off. Um, where literally all you need to do in that context is babysit people. Um, you will, with splinters, you will, you will literally bleed your health system dry um, and your patients will do worse. You will kill patients with splinters basically in the pandemic. People will die. Um, and I'm more than happy to go you know, to, ex to expand on that. It's just a, 
I can see the appeal of it. I looked at how to split myself um, very early on because I thought it might come to that. And we've got the hardware available already in hospitals that will enable the splitting to occur. Um, but I just, you know, and I'm, I'm really sorry to all the people, and I know a lot of people have put a lot of hard work into making splitters. Um, you know, I, it's, it's just not the solution to the problem in front of us. And, but I do think that the, some of the really good stuff that's gone into the design so far can be reused and, um, in, in ventilators that actually would be capable of saving lives. And I think that it's, yeah, and I, what I'm hoping is that the people who now understand about ventilation and the, the problems associated with it can now use what they've learnt um, to pursue some alternative pathways. Great, uh, just a couple of, I'll do one more question. So something, once you have a device that's working well, um, how, what's the best way to get it into doctor's hands and what sort of, what's the minimum validation that you'd have to do to make sure it, it's demonstrated what it, it should do for a patient? So, so this, is, this is context specific, it depends. Um, you know, it wouldn't be too hard to convince me that um, you know, something was better than nothing. Um, and you know, what, you know, what I'd be looking for is, yeah, so, so my alternative here is a self-inflating bag and I don't have my self-inflating bag um, in my room with me, but your alternative is you get the patient's daughter or their brother or, or someone to sit next to the patient and squeeze, squeeze a self-inflating bag. That's, that's one alternative. And then you can have the relatives come in and run shifts. Um, so you'd have to convince me that it was better than that. Um, and, you know, in a, in a crisis. Um, and then I guess for people who do have better alternatives, then I guess that's, you know, going through these regulatory steps are a useful framework for how to do better than that. But I think this is a, this is, there's a spectrum of demonstration. It's not, it's not an all or nothing um, thing. Um, and I think the, the most, the, the single most important thing that I would want to know from the, any ventilating solution is if it if it did fail it fails noisily um we don't need we're not at forty thousand feet um in the air with our with our um device we're on the ground and if the device fails um it can be unplugged and another thing replaced with it so in terms of the reliability it doesn't actually need to be that reliable it shouldn't expose the patients to high positive or negative pressure um which is easily an easily solvable problem, but it needs to um, it needs to fail noisily, and then it needs to be able to. Res then the, you know the next thing I'd be looking for is can it respond to the patient's own respiratory efforts, and can it support patients' respiratory efforts, and that's that's um, pressure support ventilation, um, and without that mode of ventilation, you're parking patients, you're needing to paralyse them, or at the at a minimum sedate them very very heavily. So you're not allowing the patients to actually recover. Um, so you, you're probably going to be doing more harm than good if you can't do synchronized ventilation. Okay, great. Thank you, um, Eric, uh, Dr. Schultz. We've run out of time, but I think it was really informative. So hopefully um, you've gathered a little bit more information on the medical needs.